found out. So I sent my team a and little if note. any of you have pagers, hey, please turn those off as well. Some of them in the US. Blackberry, right. Right. Wow. No Blackberry during the meeting. I'm, I'm trying to. Have you found out who is Dr. Baskin? Excuse me. Sorry. Oh, I'm okay. Is he, is he, Hi, I'm uh, Tony Salvador. Hi, John. Yeah, followed you over the years, of course. We are. We are. Because he's the first to go, right? Yes. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. Looking at the human system. Yeah, the human system side. Of it. I'm a social. Looking at the human system. Yeah, yeah. Let's go that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, good to meet you. Rachel? Okay. Good. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, but that's after the whole... The yeah, panel enough, has spoken enough. and we've done the Q&A, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, he's sitting there now. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll okay, have Bass one okay. first and I'll have Tony Salvador. All right. After Bass one, we have a Q&A. <sighs> then after Tony, we have a Q&A. Then uh, we... Not the next guy, the one right after. Okay, but then I have to send them back here. Before. Do you have to leave? Yeah. Not if you see me going off track, <laughs> if you see me going off track, please remind me because uh, I don't want to mess the things up. <laughs> Should we go? Last one is also right here, yeah. Oh, yeah, the cup. Well, he went out for, for coffee, I think. Oh, so the tea break was actually upstairs. Oh, I see, yeah, okay. I thought it was just here. No wonder. All right. Yeah. Yeah, we just do it here. Yeah, we should just do it here. It's easier. It's easier because you have control. Okay, we'll just wait. Yeah, because he's the one that goes first, so. No, I knew that from before. That's why I went upstairs to sign. I had to do some things to prepare. Let me just get some water. Get some water. It's me now. I have to moderate this session. <laughs> Are you guys ready or not? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, I'm also looking for him. I'm also looking for
did you come from just for this event? Wow. That's a long time. <coughs> We've lost the runner. Uh, have we got <laughs> found him? Oh, really? Wow, no kidding. Wow. Should I start with... Uh, the uh, digital doorway, uh, in the terms of the technology, Is I, I understand. What, what's different about the... the, the so, he's going to start now. So, yeah. The, uh, I'm coming here. Yeah. What's one of the things <coughs> that makes the doorway project actually, actually work? There have been many the kinds of access. Otherwise, they look for another day and they have to like, we'll check out. We've got and the basement. Mr. Basman, yeah. yeah. you're going first, OK? okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And uh, so, so I just run off. I would like to be here for the entire time. I need to take about 15 minutes off. Good morning, and welcome back, everybody. I'll, I'll come right so back. it's not locked in. Still Could we kindly resume our seats now? Welcome back, everybody. Good morning. My name is Dr. Nicholas Alipui. Uh, I'm program director, the director of programs for UNICEF. I'll be your moderator and MC this morning. Uh, first of all, let me welcome each and every one of you warmly to this Web for Dev conference. A special welcome particularly to those who have come from outside New York, uh, from overseas. You're most welcome in our uh, viewers across the world on webcam. <clears throat> As you know, we have also an exciting group of uh, young people, university students in the room with us today those that have been contributing to the work that we've been doing here at UNICEF, particularly from the NYU, and New York University, in a course called Design for UNICEF, and at Columbia University in a course on putting development policy in practice, of thinking of new ways to use, uh, to achieve our mandate. Um, let's do something fun as we start. I will soon bring on the first speaker. We'll have two speakers. Uh, to start off with, but I wanted each one of us to just give a high five to the person next to you so that we start off on a fun note, a high hey. five to each hey. other, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our first uh, keynote speaker is Dr. Patendra Singh Baswan. Um, he is the director of the Indian Institute of Public Administration. After his retirement from civil service, he has been appointed as director of the Indian Institute of Public Administration in New Delhi. Dr. Baswan is a leading government of India Institute uh, academician um, and has been involved in academic activities uh, as, as would, that would enhance the leadership qualities and management capabilities of the executives in government and other public service organizations. It's my pleasure to bring on Dr. Baswan. Dr. Baswan. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'd just like to say that I'm not a doctor. I've been able to successfully pass myself off as one. But uh, the answer is no, I'm, in fact, I'm not a technocrat either. I'm just a harmless civil servant. And um, I think um, the speakers in the first session put matters in perspective. I thought you know, it was absolutely brilliant, and theirs was a hard act to follow. But that's made my job so much easier, because a lot of the core issues have been flagged already. And my job is to just develop them a little further. Having said that, I have a PowerPoint presentation over here. I'm not comfortable with it. Because most people who make PowerPoint presentations question the uh, visual ability of the audience. I wouldn't do that. I just let the slides speak for themselves. And I think we can start now. I hope I'm audible without the mic. Is it working? Or is the, co the color mic is, I, I'm told it needs to be activated. So whoever's going to activate it, uh, could you do it? Yeah, sorry. 
Yes, we'll start with this now. Um, here, of course, we have a country with a huge population. The figures are ballpark figures. We have the largest number of poor people in the world. Ours is a poor country. And for those who believe that India and China are going to bail the rest of the world out, I would say think again. Um, this gives you an idea. Uh, uh, can you see this slide, by the way? Yeah, is yes. it, it? OK. Then I'll, I'll let it speak for itself. The main thing here is governments get thrown out with predictable regularity. Voters are sick and tired of governments. They throw them out, and they get the old lot back again, hoping they'll be a little better the next time around. You can see that the penetration has increased. It's, it's fairly large. So it's on. OK, thanks very much. Now, uh, about reform, I'll very briefly uh, flag a couple of issues over here. Um, structural reform means changing the way the structure is. Because we need to remember that in our system of governance, graft is the rule rather than the exception. And that uh, it stems from the highest political levels, where generally the one-point program is to stay on in power at any cost. It's a very raw kind of democracy. It's evolving. When I look at developed countries, we find that this stage of their democracy, they had pretty similar systems. You only have to think of the first British prime minister. Or you think of certain governors in the US towards the end of the 18th century who auctioned all their posts almost publicly. <laughs> so you have here uh, structural reform. And here I'd just like to flag one issue. Privatization with competition, yes. And uh, we find that socialism in our country has been the mirror twin of crony capitalism. And that has delayed reform. Localization, yes. But then no one likes to part with power. And therefore, the state governments will uh, literally delegate powers over their dead bodies to the local governments. And they've successfully prevented this from taking place. Um, right to information is a major innovation on our part. And citizen charters, yes. E-governance is what the subject is today. <clears throat> um, I'll just talk about mobile technology over here. And um, I've said here that you know, it's being used by everyone. But corruption in our country, you have different kinds of corruption, obviously. But the telecom sector reformed thanks to a minister whose own reputation for probity was seriously under question. But what he did was he followed a fairly competitive method of bidding. And he made sure that his successors could not extract the same rent and are not as effectively as he did. And even now, the system is riddled with corruption. But in spite of that, what's happening is the, that um, empowerment has gone ahead. The mobile phone is probably far more effective than the internet. Our internet penetration is not great. And uh, a lot of people are using it, a lot for the wrong reasons. We can't help that. The most technologically advanced people in the country, they say, are the terrorists. They're usually one step ahead of the law enforcement machinery. Um, few requisites, yes. Uh, the point I wanted to mention over here is that we have a group of civil servants. I'm one of them. And we are supposed to man all posts in the federal and the state governments. And the moment we understand the job, we're shifted. So we move from agriculture to industry to defense from the federal government to a local government to education. And uh, that's our career path. So what happens is that the reformers are very often those in the districts, as the district administrators. All of us have been district administrators and, and magistrates. And what happens over here is um, a district officer takes a tremendous initiative. He's shifted. And his successor is a one-point program, which is to make sure that the system doesn't work, that he makes his own innovation for which he's remembered. So the ownership is not there. The question then is, how do you transfer ownership? Obviously, you need to have a reformer who makes himself totally dispensable. To let the stakeholders take over the reform and disappear from the scene very unobtrusively. If he does that, it has a chance of succeeding. And more often than not, we've seen reforms just not sustaining because the individual driv driven and to a large extent ego driven. And this is a bit of a problem. Our reformers have been remarkable people, but not all of them are saints. One is facing an inquiry for a corruption. Uh, for corrupt, corrupt activities. Another one is charged of sexual harassment in the workplace. But whatever it is, the tendency, of course, is here. Now, 
political support is not always forthcoming because there's a very high threat perception. And when you talk about e-governance, you talk about the empire striking back. And yet we find that this, this isn't always the case because politicians tend to be far smarter than our civil servants. They have their feet on the ground planted more firmly than ours are. And if the public like a particular reform, uh, obviously they have to take the credit for it, which is, their, which is their right. And support, therefore, has been forthcoming in many cases. The first case, which I'm citing over here, is land records. I'll let the slide speak for itself, if it's visible. I, I presume it is. The second case is e-service centers. The question here is that um, uh, you know, the middlemen and the touts, again, are have increasingly becoming quite e-savvy. So you do have, um, in fact, them updating their own methods of, uh, of seeking rent. And quite often, they're able to beat the system. But by and large, it has made, made a lot of difference. And the third one is about the, the rail bookings. And here I'd like to flag just an issue or two after you've had a look at this slide. You see, what's happened over here, and you're all familiar with this, is that human behavior can be modified by technology. And here you have people who were thoroughly corrupt and had a very, in a sense, a low self-esteem. Even the customers did. When we shifted all these clerks, they, the system was manual. Tempers ran very high. The touts were all around. And when they moved into air conditioning surroundings, their behavior changed. Um, there was no queue jumping. And we Indians are pretty good at queue jumping. Uh, there was none because they were given numbers. And then they learned not to spit on the walls or to shout at the officials in the counter. And the officials actually became a little more polite. And uh, their self-esteem went up because they felt they'd become high-tech officials. They felt that they were entitled to some respect. And um, their behavior changed quite a bit. Quite a few of them actually stopped seeking rent. It's, it's surprising, but it, it happened. And uh, they felt comfortable with themselves. Uh, this is the, the earliest reform, which was done in the 80s. The pitfalls, of course, are here, and they do speak for themselves. There is a sense of natural regression. And therefore, when you do make a technological change, you have to use drastic methods. When the electric typewriters came, we had to seize all the manual typewriters. And when the PCs came, then we had to lock up the electrical typewriters. <laughs> so ultimately, you know, the necessity is the mother of virtue, and they do that. The other thing is public awareness. It's increasing. We have an information revolution in the country, and people are increasingly calling us to account. So just to sum up, I just say that there is a process. It's, it, there could be a certain dialectic in a democratic process. Public awareness is gradually going to keep us honest. Um, technology has made a difference. It has affected mindsets, and gradually the customers and the public have started demanding better service. And I think that's the most encouraging thing. There are huge, there are huge pitfalls, of course. But uh, we have a long way to go, but we're getting there. Thank you very much. I'll field questions when my turn's come. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, please join me here. Um, we have a, a few minutes for a Q&A. This session was on reaching out. Uh, for Mr. Um, Baswan. Um, if there are any questions, we would take them at this point from the floor. We have some roving mics around. Yes, right there at the back. Just a clarification question. You had on your first slide, rent-seeking bureaucracy at the cutting edge. What does that mean? Well, basically, it's a euphemism for corrupt bureaucrats um, <laughs> you know, across the counter. <laughs> It's a term that economists use, and uh, it's one of the better euphemisms. Thank you. Sure. Very, very 
low rate of internet penetration in India. Yes, yes. What is the growth rate? What are the impediments to growth so that there can be increased transparency to pr help propel government reform? Uh, two or three major obstacles, as it were. One, of course, is, uh, is, is broadband. And uh, you know, we had Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi wasn't really effective. And as far as broadband is concerned, we have a state-owned monopoly looking after telephones. And they maintain the telephone lines. So you've got copper lines going around the country, which have to be replaced by OFCs. And uh, therefore, the spread of broadband is much slower than it should be. Uh, as far as the other obstacles are concerned, well, you have entrenched interests who wouldn't like access to what they're doing. Even our right to information bill hasn't really you know, taken off fully. It made, it made a difference. But I would say that the, a lot of the mindsets of the officials and to some extent of the politicians has, um, has you know, and slowed down awareness. In fact, education, and I was my country's education secretary, it had suffered a lot because uh, the social sector does not have a political constituency. These are long gestation, low visibility investments. They don't get you votes. So therefore, you have the crowding out of education and health, which means that the public awareness is much lower. And then you've got people trying to operate on, in, a, you know, in a closed system, as it were. So these are the two main obstacles. Yeah. Right here. Yes, sir. Right here. A, a lot is said about um, inequity, inequality yes. in India. And um, I wonder what your view is about the way in which the information revolution, as you call it, is affecting that uh, equity or inequity in India. Is it yes. making the gap bigger, or is it making yes. it smaller? Yes. I would say that it's making it smaller at one level, because more and more people are using it. Having said that, I'd say that the first people who have access to better technology are the haves in the small towns and the haves in the villages. And very often, these are the elements who exploit the others. So they've been empowered first, and the others would follow. Now, there is a trickle down in all of this. And uh, the gap is certainly increasing in certain ways. That um, if you take the gap between the rich and the poor, you find that the, the poor are getting there, but they're getting there ever so slowly. So the gap is increasing. Our Gini coefficient is more favorable than China's is. So we don't quite have the same inequity that you have in a communist country. And yet, ours, ours is a very hierarchical society. And uh, certainly, you know, there are people who would like to perpetuate these inequities. The government, I believe, are sincere in trying to reduce these inequities. You have huge regional imbalances in the country and sectoral imbalances. These aren't a bad thing because we believe that imbalances can often trigger growth. Yes, we have uh, the gentleman right there. Yes. Uh, thank you. you you say that uh, mobile technology is much, much more efficient than the internet uh, yes. in India. Yes. I can understand that for, uh, because of the access uh, sure. is more, more rapid. Would that mean that the Indian government is putting more uh, development uh, finance into uh, mobile technology to, to, to give access to education or, or health or, or whatever? or agriculture, uh, then the internet, uh, uh, is this something which you are seeing? I see that, that for instance, for the, my development agency, which is the French development agency, we're putting all our money into the internet and not in the mobile. So maybe we should be thinking, uh, thinking of doing something else. So can you please uh, give us your position in India, what, what is happening? Thank um, you. Reform in our country, I believe, is taking place more by accident than by design. And uh, the government had learned to take a back seat. In fact, information technology grew because there was no government department. It grew almost you know, unnoticed, as it were. If there was a government department, the WAG said the reform wouldn't have taken place. So you've had a creeping reform. You've had the mobile telephony opened up because there was corruption. And this is good corruption. It facilitates reform. So uh, to that extent as opposed to the negative kind of corruption. So what happened over here was that the reform took place because there was an enabling environment, because there was a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And uh, you know, since then, 
uh, the uh, mobile tele has, has gone beyond the reach of the government. Now, the government, even now, there are attempts to virtually auction, uh, you know, Gen 4 and uh, YMAX. And so, therefore, they, you know, they haven't given up. But uh, what will happen is that events will overtake us. Thank you. I had forgotten to uh, indicate that when we ask for the floor, that you kindly also say your name and where you're coming from so that we all know who is speaking. It's escaped my mind. We have time for one last question or comment from the floor, if there is. Write them um, at the, in the back, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Patty Michelle, and I uh, work with the uh, Millennium Villages Project at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Um, and you had mentioned earlier that uh, it's the demands from the consumers that's going to help transform a lot of this. If you could just reflect a little bit on what the demands are and where you see those trends going and how that is going to have an impact on, um, on change. Uh, the demand basically is for better services and better communication. It, it, it travels by word of mouth. When someone in a village or in a small town or a larger city knows that his neighbors have cellular phones, it becomes a matter of prestige to own one. And um, therefore, you do, uh, you, know, you do have people demanding access. And then, of course, you have the falling price of uh, mobile, mobile telephones because there's competition. And therefore, what's happened is they've been empowered. Uh, they, they have more choices. And when they see the demonstration effect, there are a fair amount of advertising going on. And one of our most effective advertisements shows, for example, the people in a tea shop in a small town. And out there, the well-heeled customers, of the mobile phone rings. So the well-heeled customers, they feel in their pocket. Then the shop owner goes through his pocket. It's not his phone either. And the chap with tattered clothes, who's serving tea, he's the guy with the mobile phone. So he picks it up and talks. So the idea is that anyone can own this. It helps. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for a brilliant um, presentation. Thank you so much. So kindly uh, remain on the stage with me. We're going to have a, a second keynote um, uh, presentation um, on uh, the topic of um, uh, the heroism of innovation. This will be presented by Dr. Tony Salvador. Um, Tony Salvador is the director of um, research and definition for the Emerging Markets Platforms Group, EMPG, within uh, the Intel Corporation. Uh, Tony leads a team of um, ethnographers and other social scientists, designers, business analysts, and technology architects who try to look for, find, and develop viable opportunities um, for creating local and sustainable uh, solutions with high-tech products. Tony, you're welcome. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Alipui and Mr. Baswan for their comments as well, as well as John's, John Gage's comments this morning. Um, I, I, I found uh, Mr. Baswan's comments particularly interesting because of the references to the accidental reform and also the references of sort of how corruption can actually influence reform. I'm not going to argue that we should instill corruption in all of our systems um, to catalyze reform, um, but I am going to argue that if we think about human systems, then maybe we can be more intentional about some of the accidental reform. And so that's what I'll talk about today. Um, this is Jason. Um, I'm going to tell a story that many people know, but maybe not everyone. So Jason was a hero of Greek myth, uh, and he went after something called the Golden Fleece. The Golden Fleece is a pelt of a flying golden goat. The flying golden goat delivered a very important person to a king in another place, Anatolia somewhere, um, at one point, and that was the backstory. Jason uh, was born to a king, and then his uncle usurped the throne. Jason grew up. He came of age. Uh, someone told him, hey, you know, you're actually the rightful king. 
at which point he said, wow, I should be king. What do I have to do to be king? And it turns out getting the golden fleece was the trick to becoming the king. So he had been in his society growing up as Jason. He became aware that he should be king in his society that already has a particular system going on with Uncle King. Right? And uh, then he goes off on a series of adventures to get to be king. Right? He leaves. He goes off. He gets to the new king where, that has the fleece. Um, he asks nicely, he said, can I have this fleece? Because you know, if I get this fleece, then I get to be king. Um, the, the king said no, and he was about to actually have Jason you know, uh, executed. And uh, then the goddess Hera actually intervened, softened the king, who then gave Jason four tasks to get through, um, really kind of hard tasks. You have to tame these fire-breathing bulls with brass hooves, you actually sow a seed with dragon's teeth. Uh, the dragon's teeth will promote the growth of these soldiers who are going to kill him if they actually grow. Uh, and Jason had to get through all of these different trials, and he gets through them with the help of the king's daughter, Medea, who Hera has caused to fall madly in love with Jason. And as a sorceress, she actually promotes all of these potions, and uh, she gets Jason through every one of the trials, at which point Jason gets the fleece um, and, and fleeces the king in the process. And, and you might actually imagine then right, that uh, it's Medea who saved his hide. Right? Um, and then they return. They go back to, the, to the Jason's kingdom. The fleece has healing powers, changes the society. He becomes king, and he marries another girl. Right? So I, I want to tell you that story because I think we'll return to it a couple of times in the, in the brief time I have. Um, but, but there's two reasons. One is that I'd, I'd like us to point to the, the preparation that Jason had to go through. Then there was all the adventure stuff. And then there's the return. Right? Uh, we don't usually talk about that too much. And I didn't either. We talked about all the exploits and the fire-breathing fire -breathing bulls and all of that kind of thing. Um, but the second reason that I tell it is because it's fundamentally a human story. Right? There's some technology involved. This golden fleece is kind of fancy. But uh, it's really a human story, and that's really what we're talking about today. A um, couple of things as I was looking around on the net for this. That's probably one of the more beautiful images of the whole sort of uh, Jason and the, the fleece. Um, this one is actually one of my favorites because it's French from the uh, Argonauticon uh, sometime, I think, around 1300 or 1500. I don't remember. But it's remarkable how everybody looks French here. Right? The, the, uh, it, it's, I mean, Jason has a suit of armor. It's really fantastic. Um, and then this is a more modern one. This is something you might imagine as a really human story. Here's Jason and Medea with the fleece sort of gently covering some uh, sort of indelicate parts um, as they, they enjoy their, their fleece moment. Um, <laughs> what I'd like to do is, is to, to just be a little bit serious for a moment. I'd like to move us in the next 15 minutes from an old definition of development that's something more like this, sort of generic improvement in countries' uh, economic and social conditions, to something not quite as, as easy, um, trippingly off the tongue, but uh, something that I think is a little bit more actionable. And, and you can look at it, and we'll go through this. Um, but I'll read it. It's innovation in novel and or non-indigenous systems and social structures. Right? that changes the existing systems and social structures that I contend may actually threaten them. And Mr. Boswan pointed to those quite clearly in some of his comments. Um, sustainable development there is then actually developing these new landscapes, these new systems and social structures that have an increased probability of fitness, right? of being able to survive autocatalytic processes. And I think that's a human systems problem. So we're going to go through this um, point by point. Uh, we're going to make a little foray through complex adaptive systems, move on to some disruptive innovation concepts, look at power and social structures, and then end with uh, uh, a little bit of summary. But um, I want to go back to the hero's journey. Uh, there's a really lovely book Joseph Campbell wrote in 1959. I believe it was 59. Uh, it is actually a really lovely book, and I suggest that you read the book if you really want to understand the hero's journey. There's plenty on the internet, and you can go there now and search hero's journey, and you'll find all kinds of stuff. You'll find these nine things. Um, the, the, uh, what he did is actually read through almost all mythology on the whole history of the world and ended up pulling out a pattern, what he calls the monomyth, one structure that is common to almost all myth in human societies over history. Uh, and, and it turns out it's actually remarkable. Hollywood has made great use of it. George Lucas very consciously made use of it when he you know, wrote Star Wars and did all of that. Uh, there's definitely a departure zone, right, the preparation for Jason. There's what he calls initiation, which is all the stuff you do in the middle to get the job done. And then there's the return. 
in the mythologies, the preparation, the departure, and the return are very important. They're considered really important for the benefit to the society, the benefit to the system. Right? And there are tools along the way that you can use if you follow the hero's journey as you're thinking about innovation practice. Right? Um, and and uh, at the end, I'll talk about what some of those are. And uh, if you send me email in a couple of months, there'll be a paper on this. Um, but if you actually think about it in the book, you can actually, at every stage, as you go through some of these, you can imagine to yourself how your practices have actually mimicked some of this, if not all of it, right, as you've gone through. And you can think about what tools that you had as you went along the way. Um, the, the, the other reason that I mentioned this particular structure is because it's fundamentally a discussion of two systems, two human systems. There's the system that the hero is in before and after, and then there's the system that the hero is in during. Right? And if we think about development and think about development activities, whether you're an NGO or a multilateral organization or a corporation, when you're creating, let's use business talk, when you're creating a new market, right, you're going from markets that you know or conditions you know, and you're moving to conditions that you don't know and don't understand and trying to do something there and then maybe trying to bring some value back to the, the system or organization where you were. It's very much the hero's journey, right? Um, and, and if we think about it that way and if it really worked for all of mythology, then maybe it can actually work for, for our development. So hold that. So as I said, there were fundamentally two different systems. I'm going to argue that they're complex adaptive systems. Right? A system, a complex adaptive system, is really a, a, a set of entities with links and relationships between them, such that if something comes into the system, there's some predictability about what goes out. Right? Uh, in a, in a, a new system, a new forming system, the predictability is relatively low. In a more established system, the predictability is relatively high. Systems actually exist to thrive, to survive. The system is an emergent property of the individuals in the systems, right? So that if, if, you, uh, if, if you start seeking the, the predictability of uh, output given input, right, the system will actually try and uh, make that very efficient, right, overall, such that the predictability is high, yeah? Um, and it seeks a balance of inputs and outputs, and that balance is called homeostasis, right, nice word. Um, the, uh, the system strives then to maintain that homeostasis. So anything that comes from the outside that tries to influence the performance of that system will be rejected, right? Because it'll unbalance the system. If this force is strong enough, the system will have to adapt, right? Um, and that's where it's a complex adaptive system, right? Uh, systems also exist relative to other systems, and that's called fitness. So if you think about a landscape of systems, of company or an organization with high fitness is relatively high and one with low fitness is relatively low. And the idea is to sort of move up that fitness landscape and become a stronger system overall. Right? The second point about the systems is that social structures are manifest within those systems. And I, I, I don't know if I can make my case strongly enough today, but social structures are probably one of the most formidable forces that exist on the planet. Right? Um, I think that Mr. Boswell's comments this morning will, will echo that, and many of your experiences will as well. When you think about development, the technology might be great, but it's the social system that will actually determine whether it's adopted and used and, and promulgated through the organization or the society, and it's, it's less about the technology per se or your own actions. The social structures um, are, are, uh, are, are largely about power, right? and this power relationships that people have. And so if I think about John Gage's comments this morning about energy per person, um, in terms of these kinds of complex adaptive systems, I might think about social power per person. Right? And I haven't done the calculation because it was just this morning, but I'd, I'd wonder if there really is a correlation in the systems in hierarchy between social power um, per person and technology growth. I don't know if it's a correlation or if it's an asymptotic function where it's actually flattening out. I, it'd be an interesting thing to think about. Um, but, but I think if we think about social power per person and understand that going forward, then we can start to understand how to influence these social systems uh, for the adoption of technologies and practices that lead towards development. So uh, I'd like to say a couple of points on the strength of the social systems. Um, in the U.S. themselves, uh, in just in the U.S., if you say healthcare reform, right, there's a, a barrier that goes up straight away. You can see it, right? The system responds very quickly and is like, I don't know about this reform thing, right? Um, even though the individuals in the system will actually all talk about it and say, yeah, absolutely, we need healthcare reform more than anything, but the system responds. There's an emergent property in the system. 
The same thing happens if you say social security reform, right? Or if you say education reform, right? Anytime somebody tries to transform an entire system, the system's emergent properties will actually manifest themselves to prevent any de degradation of the fitness to strive to thrive and survive, right, on that fitness landscape. Um, the system is strong. The social structure is strong, right? Um, finding, you know, uh, uh, finding ways uh, to adapt those social structures, I think, is where a lot of innovation needs to move. It's where we're finding some needs to move, and I'll say a couple of words about that in a moment. Uh, Jason himself, actually, was threatening the king's structure, right? And in order for him to threaten the, the king's structure, he actually had to go out and, uh, and do some pretty magnificent things, right? So uh, uh, we see here that, that the social structures can be very strong. They can really influence how technologies are adopted. Um, that an innovator or an innovation can be seen as a threat to that system. And I would contend that any time we think about uh, introducing new technologies or introducing new processes that we think about, well, who's going to think that our new thing that we think is so fabulous is actually a threat to the system? Because I think it helps us to increase our probability of having a successful innovation overall. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about two examples, maybe three. Um, just to make this point, but others have made the point already today, so I won't belabor. Um, one is Tamil.com, T-H-A-M-E-L.com. It's a, the, the sort of the touristy zone, I guess, in Kathmandu. Um, Tamil.com was started by a guy named uh, Bal Joshi, who you could argue is actually the master of two worlds, right? He, he uh, came from Nepal, privileged, went to college in the U.S., um, learned a bunch of stuff and decided he was going to start this little program called Tamil.com uh, in Nepal. Uh, and he, the, his first foray into that was to figure out um, how to sell goats online, right? So that uh, expat Nepali could actually send goats home to be sacrificed for the shine. And he figured out how to do that, not the technical part. That was actually easy. He brought that knowledge with him back to his society. But he figured out how to do it socially. He figured out how to work the social system such that uh, an expat living in London could go online, order a goat, and have the appropriate goat sent home uh, to be, you know, to be to participate in the festival. Um, the the uh, uh, I, to be slaughtered in the festival. Yes. Um, the the uh, it's. <laughs> thank you for that clarification. Yeah. The the uh, the, the uh, but and and it is something that's important and to them and and uh, so the, the uh, he also figured out how to do it with cakes and gurkhas and, and all kinds of things that were in the in the zone of Kathmandu. He increased the performance of everybody's business in that in that space, and uh, he's actually gone on into banking and all kinds of things. And if you talk to Baal and you get beyond the surface level structure of the business, what you find is that it's all about how to actually understand the social structure and the power hierarchies as he worked through his systems so that he could figure out how to modify the technologies to accommodate what he thought he was, was relevant and, 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 uh, and, and, and doable for what he needed to do on a sustainable basis. The technologies were a tool, a necessary tool, but a tool, right? Um, and and the, the, uh, the social systems in place, how he manipulated those and how he worked with those and how he made that a better thing overall, that's the key to his story. Right? Um, we could, uh, oh, sorry, that's Bal, forgot about that. Um, we could talk about our own work, uh, my own work with the Classmate PC, and, and I'll mention it only momentarily because on the one hand, it's actually hard to make a computer. Right? If, if anybody has ever tried to actually make one, not build it from a kit, but actually make one where you have to get all the parts from all around the world and have them assembled somewhere and shipped somewhere else, it's actually a really hard thing. And I'm an anthropologist. I think it's hard. Right? Um, engineers probably think it's not that hard because they're really heroic about it. But it's actually pretty darn hard. So, you know, it's a systems problem. Right? Um, what's really hard, though, if you're thinking about a computer for education, is really thinking about the education systems that exist in different countries and districts around the world. That's the hard problem. Right? It's distributing those computers. It's getting them used. It's getting the content done right. It's having the people, the administrators, the parents, the teachers, um, have the capacity to use them, but also buy into understanding how they can be used to achieve a better education experience on the whole. Right? That's the hard part. That's a part that, that's actually the more, the, the biggest part of the group that we have now trying to do this is about that and less about the technology side. Figuring out on a country by country basis that, that where we have business to understand how the systems need to adapt and work with the local population to figure out how they want the systems to adapt and work with the technologies that we can provide um, somewhat uniquely. So um, if I go back to this then, very, very, very briefly, um, this definition here, 
I think that what we see is that innovation um, is change, and sometimes it's relatively violent change, not violent, fisticuffs violent. It's violent in that it affects the system. It forces a change into the system, right? Um, and in that sense, it's kind of a heroic activity. Uh, but it's also happening in novel or non-traditional systems, right, relative to, say, most of us, right? If we're doing something, or we live in the US or England or wherever, and we go off to another place to try and affect some change, we're acting in, in a place that's not indigenous to us. We're not a part of that social system. We're not a part of that social hierarchy. We don't understand it in the way it's understood there. We can maybe bring some relief to it, right, and give some, uh, give some sense of what it is, but we're not a part of that system, and I think we need to recognize that. Right? Um, those social structures are very strong forces, and I think they're not changing or, uh, and not able to change, perhaps, as quickly as the technologies can change to meet some of those needs. Uh, so maybe there's some innovation to occur there. Right? Um, and then the idea is that we're going to actually change them is, is a very hard thing to do once you start really thinking about it. Um, and so sustainable development is the same definition as before. The idea is to figure out how the technology innovation or how the innovations you're bringing uh, or that we're working together with are actually going to have a place in a future social structure. So just for practical purposes, because I do work for a very practical company, um, here are some things I think that we can do to start thinking about how to engage social systems. Right? Uh, I think the first one is to actually plan out in time far more than I tend to think we do. Right? Um, I think we think to the case study or we think to the pilot test. Uh, I think we should think five or 10 years out any time we're starting to create, whether it's a new market or a new kind of system, um, and have maybe multiple end states. And along the way, you're sort of testing against your strategic view and, and, and sort of seeing, does this make sense still right, as we go along? I think another way of thinking about it is to network systemically. So if you understand the system in place, um, you can network through that system and figure out both vertically and horizontally where those power structures are. So I'll tell you one little story about that. Um, it's a little bit out of school. Uh, we have many pilot studies around this classmate PC. Uh, in one particular country, we had a pilot study that on the face of it went fine. Everybody was doing their thing with the computer. But in the reality, if we look down underneath, it really wasn't being adopted. It wasn't being used particularly well. Um, and it turns out that one of the reasons was because there was a little bit of a backlash from the teachers and the parents who didn't quite understand what was going on. And they sort of, they, they, they sort of said, well, you know, no, I'm not so sure about this. And it wasn't because they didn't understand it. It was because it changed the relationship of the parents to the teachers and the teachers to the students and the teachers to each other. That one piece of technology actually affected those relationships in a very interesting way. And so we went ahead and, and did our own little ethnographic research, because that's what we do, um, and, and tried to figure out what was going on there. And it turns out that in this case, we had uh, started this pilot um, with a little bit of fanfare in a particular school, sort of made a big deal about it. Right? The school was interested in that. Um, and that was exactly the wrong thing to do. What we should have done was gone to the president's wife, um, who was very interested in education, and said, hey, we, we're interested in doing something like this. If you agree, we'd like to actually get your support. Um, and we'd like to do it very quietly. Do you think you can help us there? Right? That's where the power was in that system. So if we do an ecosystem map, there were all these education institutions and teachers, unions, and all this sort of stuff. Right? But it was really the president's wife who had a significant amount of power over that system. And that's where you really want to affect change. And so if we had thought about it, and we have now, um, we would do things somewhat differently. Right? Um, I think another thing to do is to ensure your visions resonate through with um, uh, the system and, and through the local population. I think you need to test that. I think we all do, to test that on a continuous basis going through. What is it that we're all trying to do together, not, is it, not what is it am I trying to do? Right? Um, I think we want to understand, and, and this is where you're going to go hire your local anthropologist, right? Um, how how local institutions manifest these social structures. Right? Where is the power in the system? Like the little example that, that I gave. Uh, I, I mentioned before you want to think about your development as a threat. It is going to threaten something. Right? So how do you think about it as a threat? Uh, what does that mean to you? It, it might be the way you want to go. It's fine. Right? But how do you think about it as a threat? What is it threatening? How can you mitigate that threat to increase the probability that the overall innovation will be um, uh, adopted and used? Right? Um, one of those tools that I mentioned with Jason and in the hero's journey is supernatural aid. Um, there's, there's actually always supernatural aid. Right? Uh, some people have called it the champion of the system and that sort of thing. I think it goes beyond that. I think it's less about the champion, and, and although the champion is important. Right? Um, but it's actually more about, again, who can influence the system in really subtle, low-key ways that won't be threatening. Right? 
uh, and, and seek those kinds of, 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 of uh, uh, partners and support um, actively as you're going through your, your endeavor. Um, and then finally, I would argue that the pilot testing and all that that we do is often about the technologies. I think that it actually should be about the systems change, about the vision that you're enacting, um, about the local social structures and, and finding where those threats are and trying to mitigate them in some way, um, or figuring out, okay, this isn't going to work this way. We have to change what we're doing. So I think pilot studies are system tests, not technology system tests, but social system tests. And I think we should use them for that purpose very actively. Uh, so that's, that's a start on that, on that point there. And then in the end, um, I think what happens if we look at Baal, for example, um, the successful hero becomes the master of two worlds. And this goes right back to Joseph Campbell's uh, argument about the hero's journey, that a successfully returned hero um, becomes the master of both of these worlds uh, and can operate in them. And in my case, the master of two worlds is the master of two systems. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tony. Let me invite you to join me here. Um, thank you for a brilliant, um, excellent presentation. Uh, very thought provocative, uh, by, all, by all means. Um, we, I would like to now launch the Q&A session. Um, I have both of the panelists uh, on the stage with me. Um, the floor is open. We will take questions uh, for about five, ten minutes. We have a few minutes. I see you, ma'am, right there. And uh, Thank we'll you. come back to you just in a moment. I'm uh, Miriam Desable from uh, UN Economic Commission for Africa. Um, I have actually a question for both, but maybe they can uh, merge the question. Um, there is one aspect in Mr. Salvador's uh, presentation that I didn't quite um, find uh, consistent in the sense that if indeed the hero has to become the master of both worlds, he has to come from one of those worlds. And uh, I see him smiling, he knows where I'm getting at. And, and it seems that when um, we, we come from a definition of development that is exogenous, that comes from elsewhere and get to a, a place that is totally you know, different in terms of system, in terms of some social structure, power structure, etc. Isn't it an inherent um, recipe for non-success? I mean, I don't want to say failure because it wouldn't be a failure, but in order to have a perfect success in innovation leading to development, it would have to come from within. I mean, Jason came from home, went elsewhere and came back from home. It's like your Baal friend, the Nepalese friend. So, so I don't understand how you can come from one to another and really ensure success in, in uh, making sure that development comes from elsewhere, even if you have, let's say, local anthropologists. And, and, um, and the second question, which is to the first uh, panelist, but it's still the same thing. Um, how do you make sure that you mitigate the resistance to change, resistance to technological change? Because most of the time, including and particularly in civil service, there is an inherent resistance to something that will by nature affect and disrupt the power structure that is well established, that is working fine, everybody's happy, everybody's uh, getting its, uh, its share of the blanket. So how do you mitigate that so that it doesn't become an, a complete obstacle? Thank you, sorry for the length of the Thank question. you very much. Um, I, I suggest that we take a couple more, then we do one cluster of questions. I see you right there. Um, Hi, my okay, name is Jin Chun Wang. I work for the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, I have a question for the, the director. Uh, would you please tell us more about your classroom project in Intel? What is status and uh, what is goals and when it will be finished? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So you have the floor. Uh, could we have a mic here in front, please? Thank you. My name is Dennis Kilhuli. I, I have a question for um, Tony from Intel. And uh, it would be on the one laptop per child experience. Now, um, Nicholas Negroponte, I've known for 20 years, and so has John Gage here. Right? And uh, we were encouraging him to see the movie uh, How the West Was Won, which means putting telegraph poles and railways up in the West before you think of the PC moving forward. But um, 
uh, the question for Intel is, where do you see yourself? The PC is now essentially evolving into an intelligent device on the end of the network. We are at the point where the network possibly can actually do stuff. And um, where do you see yourself in the network? And where do you see the web evolving as um, we move towards the next generation? Thank you very much. Um, one last, yes, ma'am, you have the floor. Good morning, my name is Daphne Nedelhorst. I'm the founder of Sawa Global. And we work in 50 countries worldwide and we look for local heroes, people that we've never heard of before. And we look for the innovations that they have done in their communities. And we're finding that these people truly have the answers of what we mentioned here is development, but they have the answers to the critical questions and challenges that we're all trying to solve. So my question to Tony is, how has Intel looked at finding the innovations at the local heroes in the countries that we focus on? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's turn it back to the two panelists. Um, and then we'll see, we're running out of time, but we'll see if we have time for another round. But please, Tony, you want to go first? Sure. Um, Try a little gymnastics here. I think the first and the last questions are actually very closely related. Um, in, in, in terms of figuring out the, the difference between where the person or the developer, the innovator or the hero comes from, I, I think that, that in any partnership, if, if, uh, that there's an exchange of value, right? Uh, and actually, George Zimmel was a philosopher in the turn of the 19th, 20th century, uh, 1900, um, where uh, he actually argues that humanity is defined, humanity is defined by the fact that we can exchange, right? Um, where each party in a transaction gives up something with the hope of getting something else. So in terms of the, the partner going out and coming back and all of that, I think it's the notion of what's the value that each partner brings to the equation, to what's going on. And I argue that sometimes we don't think enough about the local heroes and the local system value and the local innovators that um, do actually have a lot of value that we don't privilege because we think we're doing something great, right? Um, the, the, uh, and, it's, and many times we are, but if we don't actually listen, then um, we're, we're reducing the probability of success overall. So I, I think that's how I might address those two questions. I think that um, related to the other half of your question is how does Intel find those, those folks? Um, I, I would say that, that uh, and to go to the class, the, the question on ClassMe PC, I'll address a piece of that. Um, the, the, uh, what we look for is where um, we think people are strong and have ideas for, uh, that resonate not with our technology per se, but that resonate with a direction for where we think the experience needs to be, right? And we try to, to understand that experience not in the terms of what Intel thinks necessarily, but understand the experience from a human perspective. What is the education experience that we think um, is, is supported, say, with access to a variety of resources? Um, last night we were talking, for example, and said that uh, forgetting all about testing, forgetting all about improvements in education on the a measurable test level, think about um, before and after microfiche. Right? What, what is the impact that that has on the ability of people to actually just answer questions? Just think there, right? Um, so if we move forward on that, on that level, we look for folks that are thinking within their system of how to do that. And we actively look for them. I, there, we have teams of uh, social scientists and ethnographers that actually live in other countries and that are from there, right? even though our company isn't from there. Right? So we, we, uh, we, we work that way. So that's, that's my, where I might address that. Did okay. you want to add? Uh, yeah. yeah. Just a small Special. supplementary point about endogenous solutions vis-a-vis -vis, um, exogenous ones. I'd say that uh, for reform, you might need someone from within that area who has an outside exposure or someone from outside who is able to transfer ownership to the community and then disappears. So what happens is that uh, I'd say that returning migrants like Mr. Joshi is an example of that. And we believe that migration uh, provides a double benefit. It benefits him who giveth and him who receiveth. It helps. Thank you very, very much indeed. Actually, to both I need of to you. just address one. Okay, Tony, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You did ask a question very specifically. Sure. Um, I didn't answer that. Uh, I think that, that um, I don't know exactly how your question relates to OLPC, so I'll probably skip over that part. Um, Oh, okay. 
then, then uh, just to be fair, I think that what we're looking at here is, is and I would trans translate the question into something you might have asked, which is, how does computing technologies overall um, actually address issues around literacy and literacy writ large? So if I look at the UN definition of literacy, it boils down to the expression and creation of meaning, right? And if I look at the, uh, the expression and creation of meaning both in education institutions and out, what we see very broadly that is, has to be obvious is an increase, a, a gross increase in media literacy. And I think this is one of those magnifying forces John Gage was talking about, that, that you see a, a, a strong magnification of literacy in different kinds of media, whether it's small snippets of audio or video or text or video and audio and text. Um, coming together and the tools to do that, to create that literacy, I think are what are gonna start driving some of the adoption of technology. And, and that's one way of actually sort of, mm, I was gonna say bottom lining, but maybe this isn't the right place. One way of summing up, right, um, some of the social networking and the YouTubing and podcasting kinds of activities, which is really a notion of creating and expressing meaning, right, through social structures, right. Um, and so I think the technologies will start to form around that, and the technologies that have the maximum benefit one way or another um, will, will, I think, so, will, will win, win out, I guess, or there'll be a gross diversification as well. So it could go either way. Yeah. Thank you very much to our two panelists, Mr. Baswan and Dr. Salvador, for a brilliant presentation, and to you all for your questions. We will continue um, with... Um, uh, a panel discussion. I would like to now invite uh, our panelists to take their seat and uh, we'll bring on a new uh, team of uh, panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Before, thank you. Before we, we bring on the panel, um, I wanted to take a, a moment here to um, express uh, our gratitude um, and thanks.